Hi, it's Kirby Summers, and I welcome you to my true crime podcast. Hold on a second. It's asking me something that's very odd, so I'm just going to X that out and continue. Today is January 12th, uh, 2023. I hope that your new year is going well. Uh, I am still trying to get better, but um, I suppose eventually I will. It's just a matter of um, maybe not working 24-7. Before I start, I'm going to say uh, thanks to all of you who have subscribed because my goal is to get to 10,000 uh, subscribers by February, so that's next month. If you haven't subscribed, please do so now. There are about 40% of the people who watch my videos on a regular basis who are non-subscribers subscribe. Don't be shy. And if you um, are here, like the video, please. So I want to bring you up to date on a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my everyone, but today for my patrons on Patreon, because I shared with my uh subscribers of my Epstein Project newsletter, as well as with the subscribers on Substack, I shared with them that photograph of Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell at the Bohemian Grove with details about when the photograph was taken and, you know, sort of like receipts. I am uploading it as I speak literally to my Patreon. So thank you for um, your support for the last couple of years. And if you're not a member, hey, it starts at $5. So it's sort of my tipping jar, but I always make sure to put information in there for you. Uh, so buy, consider uh, buying me a cup of coffee <laughs> this morning and joining my Patreon. And there you will find that photograph of Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell. Okay, so I um, I recently wrote a new Epstein Project uh, newsletter with information that has never been shared before. Uh, the response I've received is is quite phenomenal because, you know, again, it's information that has never been shared before. Now, some of this information I've had for many years because of my abuser, who is the son, I'm just going to use the last name, Rickless. Um, Rickless owned a conglomerate called Rapid American Corporation. Um, there's a lot that he did with that corporation. He owned subsidiaries. Among them was a company called McCrory's. Uh, beneath that was a company called Playtex. So the way that these people who become multi-billionaires because they're working with intelligence, like Leslie Wexner, is they form what is called shell companies. And one company owns the other, owns the other, owns the other. Ultimately, Rapid American Corporation also had another owner. It was called the Rickless Family Holding Company. And so when they work uh, covert operations, which is what I go into in my Epstein Project newsletter of Tuesday, the 10th, Here's the thing. This newsletter is so important that if you come in today, so it's two days after I've sent it out, anyone new who becomes a member of my Epstein project for at least the next week or two, I will send this to you because this is important information that no one has ever written about before. So I want to share uh, like just... I can't tell you everything clearly because I want to keep my channel on YouTube, but I will say this, that my uh, abuser's father had a special attorney. They all have special attorneys, you know, that they can confide in, that they can sort of get 
information from. And in his case, it was uh, Harry Watchell. Harry Watchell it was, is basically the David Boys of his time. Uh, he also had a firm called Gold and Watchell. He had another company called something else. Uh, Watchell was uh, the reckless go-to guy, sort of like, you know, his fixer, let's say, as well as his attorney for certain things. Well, what happened with Watchell, I'm going to share this with you, is that um, in 1962, uh, Watchell approached uh, Martin Luther King and offered to become his attorney. So the attorneys being part of what is called a management situation, sort of like pretending to be on the side of the person that they're supposed to be representing, but essentially working for the intelligence community, and in this case, the CIA and the FBI, because ultimately what happened was, as, as we all know, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Um, but the fact that the Rickless attorney befriended him at a luncheon in New York City in 1962 is an important uh, tidbit that you have to sort of keep in your mind because let's remember that J. Stanley Pottinger, who has worked with David Boyes and who then partnered with Bradley Edwards, has been the attorney for minimum that I've heard recently, 69 of the victims of Jeffrey Epstein. Pottinger worked for the Civil Rights Division during the term of three presidents. So he worked in that division under Richard Nixon, under Gerald Ford, and under Jimmy Carter. Um, and, and the one thing that I think everyone has sort of gotten sort of used to understanding is that when, when the government says that they have a civil rights division, it means the opposite. It means that it's it's we don't have civil rights because at the very same time that they create a civil rights division, what do they do? They start spying uh, on the citizens of the United States. They open your mail. And in the case of... Uh, uh, I, you know, a lot of this stuff, I'm sorry, I do get emotional. I'm not a trained uh, spokesperson, and some of this does uh, get to me at times. But, you know, I, I recover quickly, and I'll keep going. Uh, so for Martin Luther King, you know, they had a really, uh, they really tried to get him to kill himself so that he would not have, they would not have to go and have him murdered, right? Because he was always surrounded by a group of guys. And technically the FBI was supposed to be watching him as well as the local police wherever he went. What, what King must have never uh, suspected was that there were moles in the police department and within the uh, Bureau of the FBI and that they they were not necessarily there to protect him and certainly were not there to protect him on the day that he was, uh, in fact, assassinated. Um, and so uh, it's important to remember that attorneys are suspect. So we also have the same situation happen with the Franklin scandal. John DeCamp, who wrote the first Franklin scandal book. And frankly, I'm, I've got issues with the second Franklin scandal book as well. So in my opinion, I've not seen that there, you know, no one has written a Franklin scandal cover up child abuse book that has all of the elements. 
what happens is that you have somebody like John DeCamp, who was William Colby's good friend. Colby was the director of the CIA, write a book about the scandal. And what these books tend to do is they tend to present themselves as, oh, all the information is here. And this is the only book you really need. And even if they have two or three people write similar books with similar information, some books that are, well, most books that are on the market, obviously, are just propaganda. They're, they're, they're controlling the narrative. And so um, what I did today on my Substack is I included one of these uh, authors, uh, her name is Conchita Sarnoff, who claims that she could not get a publisher for her book. She was one of the first people to write a book on Epstein. However, it was a Mossad agent, literally a confirmed Mossad agent. Uh, even Wikipedia has him listed as a Mossad agent. Uh, Victor Ostrovsky. Uh, so like on his Wikipedia page, if you go there, it says Victor John Ostrovsky, born November 28, 1949, is an author and a former Katska. I think it's called Katska. What? Katsa. All right. For, you know, I don't speak Hebrew. I only know the numbers. <laughs> anyway, I only know the numbers in Hebrew. Uh, so case officer for the Israeli Mossad. And then it goes on to say he authored two nonfiction books about his service with the Mossad. One of them was called By Way of Deception. So this woman, uh, Conchita Sarnoff, uh, had Victor Ostrovsky, a Mossad agent, publish her first book. I have this chapter in my book, Galen Maxwell, an unauthorized biography, because I came across the fact that, oh, there's something not right here with Sarnoff, because I was trying to connect with her. Uh, at the time, I was helping, I was helping, and I'm blanking out, why would I blank out on his name? Uh, and his name is so popular, but you know, I'm still sick, so I'm blanking out. I, oh, Sean Atwood. At the time, I was helping Sean uh, connect with what's called talent. And he wanted to speak with Conchita Sarnoff because she had written the first Epstein book. So I, I'm like, okay, I'll find her for you. And, I, and the fact is that I couldn't. Um, she had no Twitter. She had no Instagram. She had no Facebook. She was supposed to be the head of a nonprofit organization called Alliance to Rescue Victims of Trafficking. And the website was non-functional. It basically said uh, that, you know, coming soon. So all the emails that I sent to her at the email addresses that I was able to find were undeliverable. And so... What I was able to find was who sat on the board of directors. And, you know, and frankly, I put it up on Substack for free. So I'm going to put an, a link to that article on Substack for you to go read it for free. I do occasionally upload free articles on my Substack. So if you have not become a subscriber, you know, you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. I become a subscriber. Um, so, you know, I, I, um, I discovered that the attorney for her nonprofit is a man by the name of Taff W. Smith, who works at Kirkland and Ellis. So basically she hired the same law firm that represented Jeffrey Epstein. And by the way, Kirkland and Ellis is also the same law firm that William Barr worked at. And so his bio on his attorney website, and I'm going to read this to you because I think this is interesting. Teff was selected as a civilian participant for the Capstone National Security Seminar, 
week of the Army War College's year-long program for future military leaders. He was invited to participate in the Naval War College's similar program. Teff has long been a nationally ranked squash player, having won five national age group championships. He's currently ranked number one in his age bracket. It goes on to say that he has a, a, a sports car and he races. But in any event, it says he authored a book for the Due Process of Law Foundation. Now, here's, here's again, where we come across somebody who's an author who authors a book. And it's supposed to be uh, to enhance the rule of law in South America and elsewhere. Uh, titled Selecting the Best, the Selection of High-Level Judges in the United States, Europe, and Asia. Um, we know that there's some uh, devious stuff going on with that book, right? Um, so the other thing that I wanted to um, share with you that on her board of directors, directors for the nonprofit that I couldn't find because it didn't really exist is um, the Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs, a woman by the name of Paula Dubriansky. Uh, she was nominated by George W. Bush on March the 12th, 2001, and she became the Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs. Um, she served as senior vice president and director of the Washington Office of the Council on Foreign Affairs from 1997 to 2001. Now, Epstein was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations from 1995 through 2009. So they undoubtedly knew each other. So now we have somebody sitting on the board of Conchita Sarnoff's nonprofit agency to help traffic children with somebody who knows Jeffrey Epstein very well. And by the way, Conchita herself has said on the podcast that I was able to see and find her on that she too knew Epstein. Okay. She has um, someone else called Otto Juan Reich, who was born either in 1944 or 1955 who is, quote, an American diplomat and lobbyist. Lobbyist, you always have to be careful about the lobbyist, right? Because as an example, Craig Spence, who was part of the Franklin scandal, was a lobbyist. So when you see the word lobbyist, don't take that at face, face value. That's when you're supposed to, your antennas go up and you're supposed to like start digging. So, okay, he's, it's described as a lobbyist, and then it says uh, for the administrations of Presidents Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush. And then he's been dubbed a political thug who is externally implicated in secret CIA networks. All right. From 1983 to 1986, Reich established and managed the Interagency Office of Public Diplomacy for Na Latin America and the Caribbean, which sought to promote the Contra guerrillas in Nicaragua. Um, so he is also connected to Oliver North. You all know who Oliver North is. Um, he, he managed a staff, including officials from the CIA and the Pentagon, some of whom were trained in psychological warfare. And he, during this time, reported directly to Oliver North. All right. And um, although the office was under the, the umbrella that the government uses for people who are connected to the CIA, uh, which is just the State Department. So when you see State Department, and you read some unusual activity on behalf of that person, there's a good chance that person is actually a CIA agent. Um, let's see if there's anything else that I have left out of this. You know, I 
But to get back to the Epstein Project newsletter that I sent two days ago, I, I do mention Bernie Madoff. And I mention um, other things. I might mention Diane von Furstenberg. And um, I bring up the question as to whether or not she was at one time someone in a position like Virginia, because she seems to know things that only somebody on the inside would know. And having been around uh, these this stuff for a number of eight years, only an insider would know certain things. So there's information about the moon landing that Rickless was in charge of, he was selected by the government to make the spacesuits for Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin for Apollo 11. I include that with receipts to show you whether or not it really happened. Now, here's the thing. Rickless was under investigation for narcotics um, smuggling between the United States and Canada for a very, very long time, except that the government of the United States, and in fact, the government of Israel, gave him plum assignments. So um, I did find that I had in my notes for years ago, um, something that connected one of his companies to Mossad, and Mossad was like, oh yeah, it was written up in the Jerusalem, Jerusalem Times, confirming that indeed one of the reckless owned companies was thanked by Israel for their help with the Mossad. So I have all of this and more, frankly, in the Epstein Project newsletter of Tuesday. And then I've got the one on Conchita Sarnoff and Viktor Ostrovsky free on my Substack. I will wrap this up. I don't want to make it too long, but again, I want to thank all of you who support my work. That's just so important to me because clearly the, the, the obvious thing is that it allows me the ability to focus on connecting the dots and sharing what I know with what I find, because sometimes what I know helps me uh, figure out what direction I need to go in in order to find information. So for example, who else would have been able to connect that Michelin Rickless, who, who basically you know, went to the same school as Leslie Wexner and sold him uh, 500 learner shops and was involved with Wexner and was involved with a lot of the other characters that we've come to know in the Epstein saga that his personal attorney went and befriended King, Martin Luther King, who was, you know, set up, you know, it, it, so that it was so premeditated that we have a covert spy have his attorney go and befriend him. One last thing before I, I, I say goodbye. Um, the company that that one attorney began, Gold, also uh, continued to help Rickless even after Gold, the initial guy, retired. Um, I'm just going to use, ah, you know what, I'm scared to use that name. So what Rickless did when I was able to muster up the inner strength I needed to walk away from being a sex slave, because there's a difference. People seem to, so for example, I talk about Vicki Morgan, and she's referred to as a mistress. She was 17 when Alfred Bloomingdale, who was in his, I think he was 56 at the time. So she wasn't his mistress. She was his sex slave. And so um, when I mustered up the inner strength that I needed to leave Rickless in 1993, Mishillam, his father, who, 
you know, I write about in this article, once again, had someone who worked closely with gold contact me. This man befriended me, became part of my life for well over 20 years, called me on a, on a regular basis, took me to lunch, took me to dinner, and basically kept an eye on me and kept a file on me until he retired not too long ago. Clearly, somebody else is in charge of that file now. The last time I saw that attorney, who in fact I write about in my memoir, The Billionaire's Woman, I was convinced he wanted to, he, he was going to finish the job. He was retiring. He'd already explained to me that he had given my file to Ira and that he was going to be moving to, I'm not going to name where he, he moved to, but he was going to be moving to another state from New York. He invited me to lunch and um, I had never invited him into my home. Whenever I met him, I would meet him at the location or I would meet him on a certain street uh, but I would never invite him up to my apartment because I always had in the back of my mind that he would harm me in some way. Well, I think I was right because the very last time I saw him, um, he uh, was acting very bizarrely. So as he's crossing the street, I spot him. Naturally, I start walking toward him. And before we even get to the sidewalk, He's pointing to my apartment. He says, let's just go up to your apartment in a very, you know, like he was usually very calm around me. He was usually very much in charge around me. But this time he seemed to be a little bit agitated. And um, I simply said, no, I, I'm hungry. I, I'm going to, we want, we want to eat. And I'd already called and made reservations at, you know, uh, a restaurant not far from my apartment. And while we're sitting there, he, he uh, grabs his head. He leans down. He's holding on to his head. And he is saying, this was ill-advised. This was ill-advised. And he started to do this right after he once again turned to me and said, I want to, you know, talk to you privately in your apartment. And frankly, the restaurant where we were at, there was only like one or two other people at one or two other tables. He could have easily talked to me privately, which he had done when we had gone out to dinner or lunch before. So I suspect that they also have attorneys that will go that extra step. This special group of men that we've encountered in the world of intelligence and by using the Epstein story as a portal who will definitely get rid of what they perceive as a problem. So I have no doubt that um, on that day, he, his intention was to, to kill me. I have no doubt. I used to joke with my best friend, um, who's a guy, who's a man, I guess, suppose it's a better way of, of saying this and say, you know, I never know if he wants to sleep with me or kill me. And as it turns out, what he really wanted to do is kill me. But anyway, I'm going to let you go now. Uh, wherever you are, have a nice day. Remember, like the video, like the video. All right. See ya. Bye.